Everybody, good health, and welcome to today's edition of About Health. I haven't been with you in a while. Glad to be back. Um, I thank you for taking the time to join us. Um, today, it's kind of much, pretty much all about you today. We want to, uh, uh, you know, I believe in kind of new beginnings. So today is kind of a new beginning for us. We've been off the air for a while for a good reason, and I hope that uh, you took the time to support KPFA. And if you didn't, I'm sure that there is no time limit for your willingness to contribute. So um, uh, is, is everything going well out there? So, so time for you to contribute. So if you didn't take the time to contribute before during our pledge period, I want you to, um, to, to take the time now. So today we're going to have pretty much an open phone line, a group of uh, issues that I'd like to discuss, but some things I'm sure you would like to discuss as well. And in addition, I, you know, one of the things we haven't done in a while is I'd like to have you uh, call us and let us know what you'd like to hear about and who you might like to hear from and who you've read about that you might feel is a... Um, um, is a is a good person for us to interview or a good subject for us to take on. So uh, if we haven't hit your area in the past, I want you to give us a call and let us know. Or if you've got a problem, you know, a medical problem or somebody in your family uh, has a problem or you think that uh, you want to make a contribution or you can assist someone else that you hear on the phone with a problem, please don't hesitate to give us a call at uh, 848-4425 is our number. In the 51 area code, one eight hundred nine five eight nine zero zero eight is our toll-free number. So we want you to join us and let us know. In addition, uh, you know, you can follow us uh, during the week. Doc, uh, everybody has to have a Twitter account. We've had one for a long time. Uh, it's Dr. Lenore. If you want to follow us uh, and you've got a problem that you want us to respond to, or if you want to hear what we think about uh, certain lessons during the day, we also have uh, a Facebook page called Global Village for Health. That's another place for you to get information uh, and we have uh, we have websites uh, global village of health and we'll talk about those um, sometime in the next uh, couple of weeks so that you can take full use of those so if you want to join us 848-4425 is our number in the 518 code 1-800-958-9008 all right let's start with a few things that i think are important um the uh, a lot of policy issues around now. You know, you're looking now at people who are protesting because they don't feel they have uh, become a part of the American mainstream, or the issues have been largely ignored. I saw a, a report that the uh, support for the um, for the president's health care um, agenda is uh, slipping. Well, I don't know how I could be slipping the way these insurance companies are raising uh, rates. So, I mean, if you look at your rates, uh, even though you may feel one of the privileged who has health insurance and has a job, look at how they're raising your rates. And I think that's something that uh, you need to be concerned about. Not only they're raising your rates, but they are starting to take opt out on some of the other issues. Now, they, it looks good when an insurance company says we're going to charge smokers and obese people more for health care. But, I mean, I would feel better if I thought for one minute they were doing it as a way to encourage people to be healthy. Uh, there are a lot of companies like credit unions who want employees to be healthier. In January, a company called the Waterloo, Iowa Company rolled out a wellness program and voluntary screenings. It also gave workers a mandate. Quit smoking, curb obesity, or you'll be paying higher health care costs in 2013. It doesn't know by how much, but one of the things for certain is that if you've got one of those two conditions, if you're unhealthy or you're obese or you smoke, then you're going to um, you're going to have to pay more for your insurance. And a lot of companies are doing this now. And while workers most likely see uh, most likely see an employer offer smoking cessation classes and weight loss programs, too few people are signing up for them. And it seems like the healthy, you know, what we've been screaming around here for for more uh, for more healthy agenda for people for a very long period of time. But what we've noticed is that if you look at uh, the fast food places, we've been screaming for fast food places to be healthier places for people to eat. And so when they throw in these salads and these other things, what happens? Only 23% of people even take them. And so now we've been screaming and hollering about um, these health, that we should, that our company should offer us healthy living programs where we can exercise and smoke and cessation. But too few people are, are taking them. So now companies are taking the uh, the step that if you're not you if, if you if you're not going to stop smoking if you're not going to demonstrate some level of exercise if you're not going to if you're going to be overweight they're going to charge you um, more for um, for insurance and overall the use of penalties is expected to climb in 2012 to almost 40 percent 
with large and mid-sized companies up to 19% this year, and, and there was only an 8% increase in penalties in 2009. So the penalties are going to include higher premiums and deductibles for individuals who fail to participate in health management activities as well as those who engage in risky healthy beha- health behaviors such as smoking. So the weak economy is contributing to the change because now employers are facing higher health care costs, they say. Um, they're hiring fewer, younger, healthy workers, and they're losing fewer, more sickly senior employees. So how do you feel about that? How Do you, do you think that uh, a company uh, should, your company should be involved uh, in uh, your healthy lifestyle? Do you think you should be penalized on a job because you um, don't fit the health criteria? Uh, do you think this is the only way in which we as a country can um, can take care of some of the things that we're seeing in terms of obesity, slower rot, uh, dropping right, uh, uh, right, uh, rates of smoking? I mean, so are we going to be able to do any of that? So if you want to weigh in on that, 1-800-958-9008, 848 is the 510 area code. Um, another interesting phenomenon is that uh, it, it's interesting that teenagers with HIV disease, many of them have no idea. Uh, you know, if you look at sexually active adolescents, uh, and I have several in my practice who have as many as six, eight partners. Yeah, I don't know. I don't really don't know how of what sex and how they're doing it. But I, as teenagers, I know for a fact that they're really not going to. Um, you're not going to always be protected. We always ask them about the condom use, and uh, it's always the answer is always most of the time. And so we know know that 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 uh, more than 1.1 million Americans are affected with HIV. 55,000 of them are between the ages of 13 and 24. 48% of the youth who are infected don't know they're infected. And this is a study from the University of Chicago. Now listen to that. 48% of youth between uh, between 13 and 24 years of age don't know they have HIV. Usually HIV proceeds to AIDS in the absence of treatment, but newer drugs, as you know, can prolong treatment. And sometimes I think that we're slipping into darkness because we're not, we're assuming that these new drugs are a cure for HIV, but um, that, that's just not the case. Uh, and so too many doctors may offer testing they deem at risk to high risk populations, such as, you know, uh, HIV drug users, prostitutes, and, and, um, and, and homosexual men. But uh, these teenagers are a big reservoir uh, of um, of the of the illness, and it only costs now about fourteen dollars to get a test. And but many pediatricians and many people who take care of um, of children are not uh, t- asking that if they've had an HIV test. One of the things I can say is that a lot of our sexually active youngsters are coming in asking for the test. And we see new youngsters who have asked for the test, and it wasn't ordered uh, by the primary care providers. So this is a problem for all of us. I mean, these are teenagers between 13 and 24 who are uh, who uh, 55,000 of them in this country who don't know they, that they have HIV disease. And so um, we should be screening. I mean, in, in this state, uh, decisions are made about this can be anonymous decisions without the parental consent. So that's not the issue. But um, but I think that um, uh, if we were if we we we're hoping that these new st- drugs for HIV will do the job and each day we're more resilient. The HIV virus seems to be more resilient. But I do think we need to do a better job of encouraging our young people because, you know, one of the things I learned as a pediatrician, you don't have a clue as a parent often how sexually active your youngsters are. And until we get that, in, until you get that information, I don't know how you would get it, and I'm not sure you need to have it, but you must assume that they are as sexually active as you tried to be when you were a teenager, so that's really no different. Uh, and so consequently, if we've got these kids running around with HIV disease, not knowing it, then that's a long lifespan before, um, before we're able to bring that under control. So you want to talk about HIV disease or you want to talk about anything, 848-4425 is our number, 1-800-958-9007 is our toll-free number. And how do you feel about the 7th billion human uh, is going to be born this week? I don't know if it's going to be born in Oakland or not, but I know it's going to be born somewhere. 7 
billion people. And according to the United States population, from the 7 billion child is most likely to be born in India or China, but the trend of fertility long term is in a different direction. And for the first time in human reproduction rate, is, the human reproduction rate is slowing. Uh, and in China, it's estimated that instead of um, inst- that, it's, that's going to drop by about a half because of the policies that they had, where um, where uh, you could only have one child uh, for the first time. Um, uh, our, for once our fertility rates drop below two, it's very very hard to get them back up again. So we now have 75 countries in the world where the fertility rate is below two. And that's far below the a rate of 2.2 to 2.3 considered optimal to hold the population steady. So the question is, do we need to be holding the population steady? That's one of my questions. Looking at the forecast, uh, one out of every four persons will be living in sub-Saharan Africa by the year, I think it's 2015, certainly by the end of the 21st century. And so consequently, while Europe and industrialized nations of East Asia are the poster child for the demographic shift, low birth rates are being seen in Brazil and China and in in Islamic Middle East, where the fertility rates in the United Arab Emirates are like 1.8. Japan is losing more people today than they're gaining. Now, I'm not sure how should we feel about that. I mean, should we feel comfortable? That, uh, obviously, I think if the world's resources were harnessed in a way that allowed good distribution of food and other resources, then, of course, we wouldn't worry about this. But we know that that's not the case, is that some people have a lot and some people have a little. And so uh, I think it's important to recognize that that um, that uh, there are declines uh, in certain parts of the world. Uh, and, you know, I was surprised to find that a place, you know, I always thought that Islamic countries were um, were really um, on the ball, as it were, for this kind of problem. But if you look at um, if you look at Iran, for instance, and reading through these documents, uh, the rate has fallen from seven point zero. Uh, per family in 1974 to 1.9. And uh, so that uh, some areas of the world are growing very, very, very fast, and certainly sub-Saharan Africa, some uh, some places are growing very slow. So what do you think about that? Is that a good thing? Um, so far, the world has been able to produce enough food to keep up with these, this, uh, this whole growth. Uh, then um, then uh, that's a good thing. But uh, the distribution of these uh, food substances and resources seems to be a bit uneven. So how do you feel about that? Now, how would Malthus feel? That's kind of the way I always go back to, to thinking about it. And one final article before we go to the phones, 848-4425 in the 510 area code, 1-800-958-9008 is our 800 number. Let's talk about aspirin because I think there's some very interesting uh, um, articles about aspirin recently. Taking two aspirin a day for two years reduces the long-term risk of bowel cancer in people with a family history of the disease by around 60%. Uh, this is one British study. Now, that's just a remarkable study. You know, colon cancer is one of those that seems to have a strong hereditary predisposition. Now, listen to this. Taking two aspirin a day for two years reduced the long-term risk of bowel cancer in people with a family history of the disease by around 60%. So it turns out that maybe an apple a day should be chunked for an aspirin a day to keep the doctor away because we know that there are a number of other conditions where aspirin is um, is uh, important. Certainly, uh, aspirin has to do with reducing the risk of heart disease and stroke, uh, and it does it through some of its anticoagulant properties. But all of these illnesses that aspirin protects against seems to be uh, affected by a, a particular chemical called prostaglandins. Uh, but it's not clear how exactly uh, aspirin works. But we do know that an aspirin a day can certainly reduce your risk of cardiac disease. Uh, and there may be some things in which it increases the risk. I've heard some of those. But I don't recall what they are right now. But we do know that if you've got a family history of, uh, of colon cancer, then uh, you need to be thinking about taking a couple of aspirin a day. You need to read the data, talk, share the information with your provider. But uh, certainly, I think that's an important uh, study, and I think people need to pay attention to that. So let's uh, eight four eight four four two five is our number in the five one area code one eight hundred nine five eight nine zero zero eight. And we're talking today with you about a number of issues. If you want to tell us who you want to talk to, what subject you want to talk about, if there's an interesting person that you've heard and helped, I want you to let me know today. 
If you've got a small problem or a large problem, I always say here that I don't know all, I don't know everything in medicine, but I knew, do know some of the smartest people, and I can usually tell you what path that you need to pursue. We don't try to treat you here, but we do try to guide you. Uh, and if you want to talk about any of the articles that you've read or that I've just talked about, you're welcome to join us. 8484425 is our number in the 51 area code, 1 800 958 9008. Okay, Daniel, where you been? How you been doing? Uh, hanging on. Okay. That's about it. A um, couple of things that occur to me. Um, one, with regards to aspirin, which really does have some miraculous properties, in my opinion, I think that it would be a really great thing if some pharmaceutical company would come out with a timed release form of aspirin. I do not know of any such on the market because many of us, myself being one of them, cannot tolerate uh, regular aspirin or enteric coated aspirin because they're just too hard on our GI system. So that's one suggestion I have with regards to that, but I do think um, there's a lot to be said for aspirin. With regards to population um, the fact of the matter is we have not been feeding uh, the world's population, and I'm not just talking about the fact that resources are poorly allocated. Um, that's definitely um, a man-made crisis. But uh, um, in the 1950s, the so-called Green Revolution, mm-hmm. um, what the Green Revolution did by the institution of, well, the substitution from crop rotation and uh, allowing uh, the normal permaculture, which up until the pre-war years was something that all farmers practiced. It was just the way that you did. You had an integrated farm with animals and chickens and cows and all kinds of animals. And um, you had a good balanced soil from that. So, you know, you look to nature. That's the way nature does it. You know, we shouldn't try to mess with it. Um, we should have had a population drop by about 50% um, in the uh, 1950s. Instead, what we did by using uh, uh, p- petroleum-based uh, petrochemical fertilizers, um, we uh, essentially borrowed from the future, and the result is the... Uh, second dust bowl which we are witnessing today um, we've lost more than 80 percent of all of the topsoil in this country some people some people say we've lost 95 percent well, but let me share some statistics mm-hmm. with you though yep. i mean you're right about the green revolution it brought higher yields by western farmers food production um is 41% higher than it was in 1961. Food production per capita in India today is 37% higher than 50 years ago. Uh, So that we're producing enough food. You know, the problem is we're not distributing it. Well, um, I agree with you that we're not distributing it, but I disagree with the article that you're citing in that it depends upon what is labeled as food. For example, we, we... produce a huge amount of grain. <laughs> One thing, I know this is a diversion in a serious conversation, mm-hmm. but I saw a commercial once that said a chicken doesn't have a nugget. Mm-hmm. And so we're producing chicken nuggets, but nobody oh, knows. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> um, it, it's hideous the way that we produce, you know, I'm personally someone who, who loves animals and uh, the conditions are horrific um, in industrial production. Mm-hmm. I have never... Um, bought in the last 30 years uh, uh, commercial industrial raised uh, meat products for exactly that reason. But, but I'm also a person. Go ahead with your, your main thought was pretty important. That was just a, yeah, yeah. Was just a so diversion for the sake of entertainment. Yeah. My point with that is that we need to look at what produces the highest quality level of absorbable um, proteins carbohydrates, vegetables, not just the gross yield. So that's my thoughts. And and what do you think about genetically engineered foods? I think it's a disaster. Um, I think that that 
it was one thing. It would have been one thing if com- companies like Monsanto had been uh, required under international law and our own federal law yeah. to sequester their in uh, you know uh, uh, biohazard compounds because now we have. Um, uh, um, uh, resistant uh, soy, corn, um, wheat, uh, there's two others, and they take over um, because they're much more aggressive. They're, they're classified as what are called super weeds, and it's a huge, huge problem, and uh, it would have been one thing to do it responsibly, research in a lab- in a laboratory. So far, they've come out with nothing that, in my opinion, um, we couldn't have done better by managing world resources better. Um, but that's my opinion as to what you know what is to be thought of them. I think it was a terrible idea. Well, then, thank you. Scott. I'd like to say you requested yeah. earlier in the conversation about what speakers you know people would like to have on. Okay, cool. I would like to have you know you to look into having a specialist in type two bipolar, which um, is one of the three syndromes that I have, okay. um, and it's quite rare. And it took me over thirty years until I finally found uh, um, one of the premier world specialists, um, Dr. Ivan P. Goldberg in New York City, who correctly diagnosed me with it. And it's something that is not at all well understood, even by psychiatrists and psychopharmacologists. And I would really urge, you know, there should be a whole segment on that because... It's a devastating illness, and there is no effective treatment for it at this time other than love and support. And then the second thing is a second syndrome that I have, which is Reiter's syndrome, R-E-I-T-E-R, apostrophe S, named after Dr. Hans Reiter, a German doctor who in World War I first diagnosed the syndrome in a soldier. It is a sexually transmitted disease, And I was first diagnosed with it in childhood, so you can kind of figure out the math. The major pathogen that is passed genetically is Shigella, and most people are just carriers unless you have one of three gene mutations, the most common of which is the HLA-B27 gene mutation. You'll just be a carrier, and though for 30 years I've been leading a crusade to get testing regularly, everyone should be tested um, from the age at which they could possibly become sexually active for this trait because most people have it and don't know it, but there are over a million of us in this country alone who have suffered. I mean, my life has been devastated by it. I've had 24 major surgeries. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to put together a program where we talk to experts for a few minutes about the things that people suggest to us. So thank you very much, Daniel. Good to have you back. Okay, thank you. Take care. Let's go to Patricia in Berkeley. You're on About Health. I'm really glad to hear you talk about the, the HIV and teenage sexuality and the, mm-hmm. especially to give the parents an idea of when you, I think you said something like they're going to try to be as sexually active as you were when you were their age. Mm-hmm. As a teacher, I really appreciate that. I want to talk just for a minute about sciatica. I've had it lifelong. Um, I'm 60. I've had it since I was 18. Uh, suffered horribly from it. Um, it's been prescribed and eaten through a, a drugstore and um, been to every kind of practitioner you can imagine um, and, you know, been through every kind of treatment imaginable. But it wasn't until just about three years ago that I went to a body worker and he said the original injury uh, skewed my pelvis and because I was trying to um, make amends for the hurt on one side, I was putting more stress on the other side until that grew into such a pattern that I just couldn't get out of pain. But, oh, people wanted to operate on me. Oh, no, you know, if you do not, if you don't fit in my um, 
paradigm as uh, what I can do as a neurosurgeon, can't do anything for you. And this and that and the other, and they kept looking at my spine, my spine, they said, the pain isn't in my spine. So I'd like for you to talk, if you could, about your experience of success uh, with treating mm-hmm. sciatica. Yeah, well, you know, that's usually based, for most people who don't know, sciatica usually occurs because there is some impingement on the nerve that comes out of this, mm-hmm. of the, um, uh, the nerve canal, uh, nerve, nerve comes out of the nerve system mm-hmm. and the, uh, spinal cord, mm-hmm. uh, and is pinched either by the, by the bone or the muscle or, um, or is irritated in some other way. Now, you know, it, it is, it's a very, very conservative way to look at it, but the, the surgery obviously is the last resort. Mm-hmm. I think that the first thing that generally happens is that there's a lot of uh, emphasis on stretching. Uh, mm-hmm. If you can stretch the areas around which the nerve uh, mm-hmm. runs, that's one good thing. And mm-hmm. regular, it's not just stretching every now and then. It's stretching uh, on a regular basis. And there are particular kinds of stretches that you need to do. Uh, then, of course, there's the analgesics uh, that people use in order and to um, reduce the inflammation associated with the whole problem. Uh, they're even, uh, they're even uh, after analgesics and stretching and ice, then you go on to the, consider whether or not you need to, uh, the need, there needs to be some activity directly in the areas where the inflammation is causing uh, the pressure or the inflammation on the sciatic nerve. That's where the epidurals are important. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And people get epidurals, uh, and I've known several people who got I've ep- had all that. epidurals. And then if all that fails, if everything else fails, then you have to consider whether or not surgery is worth it. And the thing about surgery is that you can't just go to the average doctor doing surgery um, on the spine. You've got to go to a doctor who either has had tremendous experience and success Mm -hmm. with spinal surgery, or you've got to go to a spinal surgeon. Mm-hmm. I mean, and there, is, and there are, they, and they do exist in the Bay Area and other places. Uh, other than that, there are ways to deal with it. I mean, obviously, in the first phase, there's exercise, there's stretching, there are things that you do about your mind. There's pain control experts who can be helpful uh, in a number of different ways uh, and man- manipulating uh, kinds of things. There's all kinds of uh, non-traditional approaches to it. There's acupuncture and acupressure. There's mm-hmm. yoga and there's all kinds of mental uh, biofeedback things that people do in order well, I to... I think re- I pretty much covered all those in my treatment if I may, if yeah. I may interrupt, and yeah. it, 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 I, you know, this has been going on for four decades, and and yeah, well, so I've covered all that. What really was helpful for me was one single one-hour session okay. with deep, deep tissue massage. Okay, that was um, to me uh, kind of like what had been um, suggested by the original acupuncturist that I saw, mm-hmm. Ellen Gunther, many, many years ago. I think she was one of the first in the Bay Area to be an acupuncturist licentiate, and she has seven medical degrees. Mm-hmm. So. It, she, you know, attacks the problem from all different kinds yeah. of paradigms. Yeah. But it was this body worker who did this very deep tissue massage. And if I had been told ahead of time that he would tell me, please feel free to bellow, I don't know that I would have gone in. Uh. But as he was doing this massage, that was the single most helpful and turnaround yeah. thing for me. I'm not free of it, but it's so alleviated. And, I can't and, tell you. and how often do you have to get them to I only did it one time. Oh, really? Oh, wow. I only did it one time. And what he told me uh, and instructed me to look out for uh, the imbalance of my body and so forth so much changed my sensory awareness of how I was favoring one side over another, oh, one leg was longer than the other, mm-hmm. how I stood, yeah. how one foot splat, splayed out uh, as opposed to the other going straight, and so many things. that. And I'm a lifelong exerciser. Uh-huh. So in my exercise, I paid very close special attention to those things. As I say, it's not gone, but it's so alleviated after four decades. All right. Well, thank you very much for sharing that. Thank you. Uh, Now, Daniel's gone. Is that correct, uh, Ms. M? Okay. All right. Let's go to Sue in Sebastopol. You're on About Health. Sue, hi. Hi. I'm calling um, with a comment about the... In char- charging the insurance rates increased premiums for those who smoke and are obese. Right. And um, it sounds like a really logical thing to do to put the responsibility on those who are having the higher health health care costs. However, um, my concern 
is we know smoking is an addiction and that um, a lot of obesity is due to uh, food addiction and that uh, a lot, the source of addiction for many people is trauma. And um, my concern is putting the pressure on people to quit their addiction um, will just create more anxiety and actually worsen their condition rather than help them out. So I was curious for your take on that and also if you have uh, suggestions on getting out of those addictions, um, you know, particularly food addictions where you can't just, it's not like alcohol, you can just swear off of it, but you got to keep eating. Um, so how do you... Well, you know, I, I I agree with you. I mean, I think that you can't. Addiction is nothing that you can take lightly. I mean, and people who are not addicted don't can't always appreciate that. Uh, and I think that that uh, I'm not sure that raising the premiums is a way to motivate people. I think, yeah. that, I think that there are other ways to motivate people. And I think uh, if we haven't made the argument that you could die if you don't do certain things earlier than you ordinarily would, and that's what the statistics say, then that doesn't change behavior. I'm not sure how raising the premium is going to change behavior at all. Exactly, yeah. I, th I think that appreciating the nature of addictions, trying to provide people with the opportunity to, like we had a, a gentleman here not too long ago who was very successful in smoking, dealing with smoking addiction. I mean, if you if you look at, uh, at the things that are offered to people and you offer people more of those things and you reduce the cost of what that is, I think many people will try those things. I, yeah. think that, that is, I don't think food addiction is necessarily the issue. I just think that, A, there are bigger people, a lot of big people, who are genetically big. I don't care how much you put them on diets, they're still going to be big people. And I think that the fact that um, that you can't motivate people with other more intense kinds of things, I doubt very seriously of raising the premium. See, I don't think it. It, it just reminds me uh, of situations. I was at a um, I was at a golf course on vacation one time, uh, and it was so far out from where we were staying that you have to call a cab for everybody. So what they do then is that they they say I want to call a cab, and they don't wait. They wait about thirty or forty five minutes to call it so that you can sit and enjoy the other things. And I think the same thing is true of these insurance companies. They are, they 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 want you. They don't. They're not raising the rates because they care about your help. Your help. They're, yeah. they're not raising. They're raising the rates. They're not even raising the rates because they feel that you know by raising the rates you're compensating for people who are overweight and necessarily unhealthy because that's not necessarily the case. They're raising your rates to raise your rates. And this is just another thing that allows them the philosophy to raise a rate and maybe uh, uh, in somebody's mind uh, feel that they're doing uh, an extra special thing for you. Uh, I don't mm -hmm. see that. So I think there are other ways to motivate people to change behavior in order to can improve their health. I don't think raising rates is one of them. All right. Thank you very much uh, for that call. 8484425 is our number in the 510 area code. We want you to join us. If you've got issues, um, then we want uh, to save a space for you. Uh, like I say, I don't know. Uh, this is a time when we give well, not 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 the cheapest second opinion in town, um, but the um, but the least expensive. And so we want you to be a part of that. I want to remind you, though, if you didn't take the time during this last pledge period to give a little something to KPFA because we are uh, here and because we are trying to save you whatever we can in terms of doctor business or keep you healthy, then I want you to know there's still opportunities to join and to do that. So 8484425 is the number in our 510 area code, 1-800-958-9008. I know you're out there. I know you've got problems. I think we're sitting here as a middle person to get you with problems to places where you can go to get solutions. I know you've got contributions. I know you have philosophies of health, and I know you want to hear about people. So that gives you a lot of opportunities and a lot of, um, of choices to make uh, as you decide to call 510 um, 848 and the 510 area code 1-800-958-9008. Now, I don't want you to think that we're out here without calls. Uh, we just want your call. We've got calls, but we also want your call. All right, so the next, uh, let's talk to you, Elaine in Santa Rosa. Thank you for waiting, Elaine. Hi, I, I just love your I just love your show. Thank you so much for taking my call. Are you there? I'm there. Okay, <clears throat> I have two questions. The first question is around gallstones. Do you absolutely have to have surgery or do you feel there's a better method? And then the second thing is is about neuropathy. 
Uh, I'm wondering if you can make any suggestions or you have any thoughts about that. Well, in terms of the treatment of gallstones, there are, there are a lot of different options uh, other than surgery. I mean, I think that uh, if you look at the ways in which we, and gallstones kind of led the, the way in trying to do non-invasive things for the management of um, of a disease. I mean, obviously, you know, there, there, there's some dietary changes that, that they want people to make when you have gallstones that have to do with staying away from, you know, from fat, from fatty foods and certain types of dietary restrictions um, and then if you talk about uh, treatment you know they talk about clear liquids and avoid fatty greasy foods um, and then uh, sometimes uh, then you just some pain control can do it but uh, then there are the other things there's a lip the trips so that just kind of wrap that that you can use when you um, when you are um, uh, thinking about you know trying to reduce them, this thing kind of shakes them. As I understand, it was one of the first um, things that people used. Um, what, what was that, doctor? What was that, doctor Lenore? It's ultrasound. It, it was. I mean, it's like a sound wave. I don't understand all the the medical philosophy of it, but it, it, it in many instances it can shatter the gallstone. And that's that's a non-invasive procedure. So how do you how do you get that kind of treatment? Well, you just have to ask your doctor for the non-invasive ways to deal with gallstones. I mean, but surgery oh. even even but even the surgery now is different. I mean, the surgery now is not that big open abdomen surgery. It tends to be a little bit more um, laser-like, and so where people can do it, you know, with um, relative um, with relative um, ease. And there's some medicines that you can take uh, that dissolve gallstones so there are lots of options i mean i don't know them all but i do know this if you had the diagnosis of gallstones and surgery has been given to you as your only option you really need a second opinion now sometimes okay thank you yeah that's what i felt well i thank you for that and then the neuropathy uh i don't have diabetes you know and it's it's really interesting i've been suffering with it and i just i don't know what it is and i'm just trying to figure out how do you you know i've given different opinions you know they want to give you all kinds of drugs for the pain and i don't believe in that so what is your thought on the neuropathy now tell me exactly where you have the neuropathy and what I have it mainly in in my legs and my feet. You know, I'm feeling it more and more in my feet as it's it kind of traveling up. You know what I mean? You know, have you had an evaluation to see if you have other uh, na- uh, uh, systemic conditions? That, like what? No. You know, well, you know, like diabetes and. No, no, I have checked. They've checked me for diabetes. No. And there's no there's no history of neuropathy in your family. One aunt, I believe, had it because. Uh, when I told a cousin of mine, she said that my aunt had complained the same kind of complaints I had. Yeah, well, you know, I think that if if you if you've got, you know, the only thing that I that I know that treats it uh, effectively is uh, having a if there's an underlying condition that you can use that you can use um, uh, that you understand or you have, and treating that condition can reduce it. Then there are a lot of drugs that you can use for neuropathy. I think if you're one of those people, then like many people in ours who would prefer not to even go that way, certainly not initially. Then I, I, there are lots of almost every non-traditional um, um, methodology deals with neuropathy. Acupuncture deals with it. Acupressure deals with it uh, naturopaths deal with it so there are lots of other things now here's what my here are my recommendations when you deal and when you're in a situation like that um, you look at all the modalities that deal with neuropathy and look at all the traditional and non-traditional ways the traditional ways tend to go that uh, I'm going to work you up for other things root and then they go for the use of, of medications um, and the non-traditional therapies are different depending on the philosophy but you your selection process of a non-traditional provider should be exactly the same. You want to know what his experience is with neuropathy. You want to know how successful has have his techniques been. And you want to know the names of a few people who have benefited from that technique before you sink a lot of money uh, and time into it just because it is non-traditional doesn't mean necessarily that it is the that it that has it has the that that practitioner has a success rate that you need to have in order to put your resources and your trust in that particular modality so that some people give a pass to non-traditional medicine and they don't ask for the experienced person they don't ask what kind of results have you had they don't talk to satisfied patients so i think if you're going to go that route that's what i would recommend 
Well, you know, I want to thank you. I mean, your program is so beneficial. I listen to it an awful lot. And, you know, you're just doing such a great service to the community, and so is KPFA. And yeah. I, I want to thank you. Well, thank you particularly for, for easing my mind around the gallstones because yeah. I know there's alternatives. Well, there's definitely many alternatives. Anybody told Yeah, me. because right away they say, you know, you got to go for surgery. And I'm, yeah, one well, of these, I'm 71 years old. You know, yeah, I've, yeah, I've avoided yeah. surgery all my life. And I yeah, thought, yeah. there's got to be another way. Yeah. So this is the first step. And I thank you for that. You're quite welcome. Uh, so, so sometimes I want to I want to be sure you understand, Elaine, that we don't know the severity of your diagnosis, and sometimes there are gallstones that are not amenable to these other treatments. But certainly, you should ask and it should be discussed. Eight four eight four four two five and a five one zero area code one eight hundred nine five eight nine zero zero eight. Not much time, but time for you. All right, let's go to Debbie and El Sobrante. You're on about health. Hello. Hi. Hi. Well, I wanted to say that I really, really enjoy your show. I love Thank KPFA. You. And when I couldn't pledge anymore, I went down there and answered the phone so everybody mm -hmm. can do that. Yeah, that's true. That's, that helps us as much as anything else. Mm -hmm. So the, my uh, call was because I was listening and I heard that the uh, person was sciatica. Right. And uh, um, I'm a body therapist and I've, I run into people with sciatica all the time. And I found two really, really great techniques that help that which are the strain counter strain, which was mostly a physical therapy technique, but I, as a massage therapist, was still able to take the training. It's called strain counter strain. Okay. And then there is the, uh, well, the, um, the stretching is really critical to do a complete stretching because usually we just do a, a one portion of the muscle stretching. And I took mm -hmm. a training that's called active isolated stretching. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, I think the trainer, of that technique is called Dr. His name is Dr. Matten, M-A-T-T-E-N. And active isolated stretching deals with insertions, the origins, and the proximal and the distal parts of the muscles, which are really, really efficient ways, and we can do it ourselves after you learn how to do it. Is he in this area? I'm sorry? Is Dr. Matten in this area? Uh, he travels all over the oh, way, oh, all over the place, okay. giving the, these seminars. I took this one seminar. Uh -huh. Actually, I had to go to Vegas because he wasn't anywhere closer with the, the year that I wanted to take that training. So it's called Active Isolated Stretching, and it is uh -huh. so incredible. I've, I work with um, people in their 80s and 90s, uh -huh. 90s. I do body therapy with them, and I've, I run into sciatica and neuropathy, and I've really had great results with Active Isolated Stretching and with Strain Counter Strain, which is just a positioning of the muscle in the spasm and holding it for 90 seconds and then it releases and people that have had chronic sciatica for years sometimes just with this technique can have it released instantly and yeah, then they yeah, learn yeah. how to reposition their body in case their posture or uh, their whatever they're doing to to um, allow this condition with their with their usually compensating and uh, so anyway that was the um, now, are you a physical therapist? Or? No, I'm a massage therapist, but I do mostly physical therapy because of the age group that I work with. I work uh -huh. with people in a retirement home, in several retirement homes. Uh -huh. So my trainings are usually in physical therapy, and these two techniques are mostly utilized by physical therapists. Okay. And then the other thing that I found is really, really magnificent for sciatica if the nerve is impinged in or damaged at the spine, because if it's pinched at the muscle in the gluteal area, then this is pretty simple. And also... Um, a uh, deep tissue massage like this person experienced and there's a technique called rolfing which is also deep tissue massage but the one thing that i think that is critical if it's impinged at the spine is chiropractic treatment because what they uh, some of the therapists do traction so it allows the the discs and um the pressure of the nerve to ease and they have of course a very very gradual technique to allow the person to slowly uh, handle the traction and without any pain or very minimal pain. But, and, and that along, for example, with a supplement called, um, well, everybody knows it now, glucosamine uh, complex that has all three of them, chondroitin and MSM, mm -hmm. works, but in high dosages, sometimes four to five, seven a day. Mm -hmm. And with the older we are, the more we need. And it takes months for us to build to that. We don't start taking seven tablets a day. You start, start taking one a day for a month, then two a day for a month. But it helps us rebuild the tissue. So all these combinations are have been really, really fantastic. 
fantastic with the people that I've been working with. And the chiropractors also look at the structure of the body and the posture and how we sit, how we stand, and they can help with the alignment. So we change our entire structure so that we avoid these type of, uh, you know, uh, impingements of nerves and in different parts of the body, of course. So... That's really helpful. Some people don't really like chiropractors, but it depends on which one you see. Some of them do not really do what we call crack my neck or uh, adjustments. They do very gentle uh, movements and also teach us specific exercises to loosen up a particular portion of a tendon. That is the one that's tightened because you are maybe a violinist and your body posture is hours a day in a twisted form. So um, also some people that don't like chiropractors can do the raw. Rolfing, R-O-L-F-I-N-G, which is also a structural uh, structural um, alignment system, but they focus more on working on the ligaments. And so these all these techniques are fantastic to realign the body. So I just wanted to share that with you. Well, I'm glad. You know, and that's what I love about KPFA is that uh, we have a lot of people who can make contributions, and we think that's an important part of our program. And I want to thank you very much for taking that time, Debbie, to tell us. I think you gave us a lot of good information. Good. I think one of the things that she's saying is don't just give up and don't just try one modality of treatment. Uh, you don't necessarily have to go directly to the medicines or to the ice or the whole deal. It may be massage. It may be acupuncture. It may be chiropractic. But those of you with sciatica out there, just don't give it up. Don't give it up. I mean, because one modality doesn't work doesn't mean that others don't. And I think there are lots of people out there who would share a similar story. So thank you very much, Debbie. Thank for you. For joining us. And now let's take a call from Rebecca. You're on About Health. Hi. Hi. Am I on the air? Okay. So um, I've had a really bad case of plantar fasciitis for about a year and a half. And I think I've tried you, you've had one. I'm sorry. Say that again. Plantar fasciitis. Okay. Yeah. Should I say what it is? Yes. Okay. Um, well, it, there's this stuff on the bottom of our feet called fascia, which is kind of like ligaments. Uh-huh. And they stretch when you walk, um, except that when you have this condition, they don't stretch, and so they pull away from the bone. As my podiatrist likes to say, they rip away from the bone, and that's why it's painful. So it's very painful to walk and to stand. Uh-huh. And... Um, well, I thought maybe you knew about it, but anyway, the, what they recommend is never going barefoot, stretching, icing, uh, ibuprofen, you know, as you see fit, right. um, and that's basically all that they recommend. Um, short of that, you know, or, or if that doesn't work, like now my podiatrist is recommending a um, cortisone shot, uh-huh. which of course is a temporary relief right. or would be a temporary relief. Um, you know, sort of worst case scenario is surgery, but it's not really recommended for this condition. Very, it's very rare. Yeah, sure they just cut the fascia, which, you know, is creepy. But, um, with the shot, uh, apparently it's very, very painful, so I haven't wanted to have a cortisone shot yet, and some people don't get relief. I'm not sure what percentage of people don't get any relief, mm-hmm. and a few people have said it makes it worse. Oh, wow. So anyway, it sounds like maybe you don't know about it, but I just well, well, let me just let me just I know I really don't know about the condition. Okay, but if the condition is an inflammatory condition, yeah, generally cortisone will help you. I mean, uh, it's it's simply because it's the ultimate anti-inflammatory agent. And here again, we don't recommend any of these things un- unless you've done everything else that you think you can possibly do to relieve the symptoms that you have. I, I should have mentioned also that I've gone to acupuncture. Yeah, if you've gone to all of these things, then uh, that, then and you and you and you believe in the people that you're dealing with, mm-hmm. you suggest cortisone. Uh, it definitely will work for anti-inflammatory conditions. It should not be used is the first therapy or the second or the third. But if you've been through all the things that you just described, then I think what you're looking at is an opportunity maybe to reduce some of the symptoms that you have uh, and to improve. Here again, uh, you know, you, you can't you can't just put all traditional therapies in one basket. And I do think that when you start talking about injections or invasive things like surgery, then you really want to make certain you've done everything else. And it sounds like you've done that. Yeah. So, so don't ignore anything that you think might be helpful um, and that is reasonable. Uh, but I think under these circumstances, I think you have you've marched through the whole process, and I don't know the condition, but if it's an inflammatory condition, then at, at some point it may well respond to an injection. 
Mm-hmm. All right. Well, thank you for taking the time to share that with us. I'm sorry I'm not I didn't know enough about it, but um, okay. but at least I do know about inf- inflammation. Yeah. Uh, and um, and so thank you for sharing. You, that what, with us. You're a medical doctor, is that right? I am a medical doctor. What kind of doctor are you? I'm an allergist, an immunologist, oh, okay. and, and a pediatrician. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for calling. Bye. All right. Let's go to Sandra and Emery Bell. Let me give the numbers again, Sandra, before so people can join you if they like. Eight four eight four four two five the five one zero area code one eight hundred nine five eight nine zero zero eight. We have that as an eight hundred number. All right, Sandra, you're on about health. Oh, okay. Thank you. I'm calling because I tuned in just as the woman was talking about her neuropathy. Right. And um, so. I was remembering several months ago when I suddenly had something that sounds similar to what she had okay. in the leg and foot, and I had never um, heard about so the psoas muscle. Right. But as I was looking on the internet for at my symptoms, right. the word psoas muscle came up, uh-huh. and so I started investigating that. And sure enough, mm-hmm. I believe that's what I had because I looked at the little videos that right. you could find right. on um, how to stretch the psoas right. or how to relax it. Right. And as soon as I did that, I was able to sleep that night because I had gone for three nights without sleeping because right. of the discomfort of right. a sort of. A, of a symptom like the one she described. So I just wondered if that was helpful to her to look up PSOAS muscle, psoas, and she might find the relief that I found. Also, mm-hmm. I found um, the caller right directly after her who was offering all those suggestions about treatment. Right. Um, that it was really interesting. I have um, done a few of those. The only one that she didn't mention, which I think has um, really helped me and, and uh, changed my body so that I'm pain-free most of the time. Um, you know, I go back for little tune-ups and stuff, but right. it's Feldenkrais, F-E-L-L-D-E-N-K-R-A-I-S. Feldenkrais work it helps you to organize your body so that, um, like, you're not holding or you know, working against yourself, and Mm. it's really helped me both in my neck and my lower back, and I think it's really important, like she said, to make sure that those nerves are not being tweaked or messed with in any way. Spell that again. F-E-L-D-E-N-K-R-A-I-S. Okay. It's wonderful stuff. And anyway, I hope that woman will check out her psoas and see if that, um, doesn't bring yeah. her some relief. Yeah, you know that that's that's an interesting um, an interesting contribution that you just made. I mean, I can I, we said that that sciatica can start either in the spinal cord mm-hmm. uh, coming through the frame and the bones, or it can come it can be a problem through coming through the muscle. Because I had a so a piriformis muscle injury, and stretching. I mean, I didn't. You know, I'm one of those people that said, "Oh, stretching this is not." Uh-huh. Well, happen. well, this it's, muscle it's, apparently is what allows you to bend forward, backward, side to side. Right. And that I guess the yoga people are, um, you know, yeah. always working on, yeah. but I had never heard of it. And if you have that problem, you're not comfortable in any position, right. Um, right. And then, especially yeah. at night. You're more comfortable, yeah. I think, standing up. But it's this really major muscle that attaches mm-hmm. from the back of your spine to the inner part of your thigh. Yeah, no, I, know, I know the muscle. Oh, okay. And Most I, people but, may not. Yeah. I never heard of it. And, and it was really, and, um, uh, you know, it was very... Um, educational to go through this problem that I had, and so yeah. now I yeah, and, and and that shows it. You know, like I said, I was started to say that I didn't respect stretching very much until I had that injury. And then I started to stretch, and then I started to stretch more, and then I started to feel better all over. So I think sometimes stretching, especially after you get to be a certain age, uh-huh. can really help you with a number of different conditions. And thank you very much for taking the time. Well, thank you to for talk taking my us. call. All right, now let's go on now to let's talk to. Um, Sandra and Emeryville, you aren't. No, that was Sandra. So let's go talk to uh, Alan in San Jose. You're on about health. Hello, doctor. Hi, I have been a sufferer of sciatica for four years now okay. after a work related injury. Okay. And I was listening to your radio broadcast and wanted to offer some insight. Please. Um, I'm also a trained certified massage therapist and have both some comments and some, some concerns about some of the things that were raised on the air. Uh, sure. Um, 
the first issue is the woman that was dealing with neuropathy in her feet. Right. If she's still listening, I would really advise her to get that medically investigated. Neuropathy of any type can be symptomatic of other conditions, including degenerative nerve disorders that are caused by bacteria or other infections. And all of those should be investigated by a doctor. Okay. Um, in terms of some of the comments that have been raised, um, my personal treatment includes uh, anti-inflammatory medication after multiple MRIs, electroconduction studies, and other diagnostic testing that were unable to pin down the specific cause of sciatica. And this is pretty common for a lot of people who suffer it where they, they have a chronic inflammation process or something else going on, but no obvious physical defect that's impinging on the nerve system. Right, okay. So my treatment is primarily anti-inflammatories, and I've had to look elsewhere for help with this. And a couple of things that I want to recommend to other listeners um, is the practice of yin yoga, which is a specific modality that is deep, long-term stretching of the fascial planes, which stretch like plastics rather than like muscles. Okay. So they have to be put under tension and kept that way in order to elongate. Um, that practice restored most of my flexibility and has enabled me to regain my gait and the ability to walk without a limp. Spell that again. Um, the modality is called yin yoga. W-I-N? Y-A-N, uh, Y-I-N. Y-I-N. Not a lot of yoga practitioners teach it, but if you seek out one that does, it is incredibly helpful in terms of restoring core, uh, okay. core flexibility. Okay. Other, um, other suggestions? I have been undergoing a treatment known as network spinal analysis. Okay which is an advanced form of chiropractic taught by Dr. Donald Epstein. It's practiced all over the country okay. by a select few uh, chiropractors that work on the fascia around the spinal cord uh-huh. rather than on direct adjustments of the spine. Okay. It works to unwind tension patterns and has been significantly beneficial to my ability to operate without pain, even though I take medication every day for this condition. Okay. Um, and what, so I just wanted to provide that to you. Well, thank you for taking the time to share that with us. We, that's like I say, that's what I like about this segment. All right, let's try to finish with Debbie. You're on About Health. We have just enough time for your question or suggestion. Debbie? Oh. Um, I was um, calling about the person with uh, plantar fasciitis. Um, uh-huh. A friend of mine in her uh, late 50s ha- um, had a terrible case of plantar fasciitis that lasted for a couple of years. And then somebody told her to do yoga, which was interesting about the color before that. She happened to like the Bikram yoga because yoga was challenging for her, and Bikram yoga made it fun and exciting. Is that the hot hot yoga? Yes, that's the hot yoga. I've done it. um, Did she she say she had plantar fasciitis? Yes, which is the color I had before. So my friend... Basically, within a few weeks of starting the plant, uh, the Bikram yoga found that the plantar fasciitis was gone, and which points out to what has been said: stretching. Stretching is critical. Right. AIS, active isolated stretching, has helped me heal my father's plantar fasciitis and um, a few other clients that I have with plantar fasciitis. And it, but it's an ongoing thing. You can't just stretch, heal it, and then stop. Yeah, well, you know, it's funny. I, I'm sorry I didn't pick it up. I thought it was a more, I, I didn't get the condition because I've had plantar fasciitis. Uh, and I've used <laughs> ice and stretching and analgesics, so I'm sorry I missed that uh, pronunciation. I, I guess it was kind of, I was kind of confused there. So Yeah, well, the, the pronunciation is hard, and, and the, then you have to get expensive shoes. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's uh, well, nerve-wracking. Yeah, I'll tell you what happened to me. I mean, I, I went to a podiatrist or somebody I love and trust, uh, and I got one orthotic and all that. That didn't work. And then I went to Target, and I looked at all those Dr. Scholl's things, wherever they were, <laughs> and, I, and I could barely walk when I went into Target, and I walked right out of there with one of those uh, one of those devices for about nine bucks, and I had about 200 bucks worth of orthotic shoes. Right. So, so I think that there are lots of things to try with um, with plantar fasciitis. Plantar fasciitis. <laughs> <laughs> certainly, certainly, uh, icing it, certainly icing it, stretching it, uh, analgesics right. can very help. And I apologize to the lady before because I read and the injections. I think that's the last resort. Obviously, I think that uh, for plantar fasciitis, I think it's not as successful as in the joint, but uh, certainly it's an option. Right. right. But anyway, I, so, so thank you very much for uh, helping me correct that, Debbie. I appreciate that. No problem. No problem. Thank you so much for your. Uh, all right, we kind of run out of time. It was uh, much too fast. I've been gone so long, and I wanted it to last a little longer but it didn't. Uh, so I want to thank you for taking the time to join us. Thank you, Mickey, for assisting us. Um, and don't forget to pledge to KPFA if you haven't already. I know the pledge period is over, and I know what the philosophy 
maybe is, but I think any time you can take a time to, to, to help the station, I think you help us. So thank you, and remember, health is your biggest asset. I'm Dr. Mike Lenore, and I think we will talk again next week. Bye-bye. <laughs> Are you tired of The Matrix? The movie? No, not the movie, but the one you're living in. If so, then hang out with your friends at The Full Circle. What's The Full Circle? Full Circle is a radio show written, produced, and directed by apprentices right here at KPFA. We'll bring you everything from the obscure to the obvious, the hidden and the blatant, as well as all things in between. So be informed. Hear about your world community every Friday night from 7 to 8 p.m. on 94.1 FM, where we'll serve you the red pill with love. And this is listener-sponsored radio, KPFA or K.